in this presentation we will tell a story about the Japanese propaganda films which are present in our archives at Sound and Vision. And these are Japanese propaganda films confiscated after the Pacific War, which was in uh, the former uh, Dutch East Indies, uh, Indonesia now. And um, at the same time, we want to still tell the story about this Dutch filmmaker who had a passion for photo photography and filmmaking and how this Dutch guy got involved in uh, making Japanese propaganda films in this period. But first, who are we? My name is Ruur Blom, I'm a media manager, uh, Collection Access at Sound and Vision, and we think it's very important to open our, up our archives as much as we can. And um, two years ago, at the end of May of 2018, we released a collection of the National Socialist Movement in Holland. This was uh, quite a uh, special collection. Um, and we did this, we uh, made it available open online together with uh, NEOT, Netherlands Institute of War Documentation and Genocide Studies. And we re released this collection as a part of uh, World War II Open Data Depot. So the meaning was to make this material open, available online. And my colleague Maartje and I, we did a presentation about this project in uh, Venice two years ago. And this is where we met Natsuko Hayama. She was present at our presentation. And she was kind of struck by the openness that we have in Holland, that we can open a part of our history which we're not really proud of, which is a quite heavy collection, so to say. But we think it's important to, uh, to open this up. And we got to talk about this, and then we talked about another uh, film collection, propaganda film collection we have, which, is the, which are the Japanese propaganda movies. So when I mentioned this to uh, Natsuko, we uh, immediately thought we had to do something with this. So Natsuko uh, is at Sound of Vision. She lives in Amsterdam and she works at Sound of Vision from September of uh, last year and she will be here till the end of June. And we want to work, we are working on this uh, collection together. Yeah. Uh, thank you for the introduction. Hello, uh, my name is Natsuko. Uh, I, um, uh, I am from, apparently from Japan. Uh, I've been working for, um, uh, NHK Enterprises, which is a uh, production company for the Japanese public broadcaster, which is called NHK. And uh, I have a um, background in, uh, well, production of the TV documentaries, and I also worked um, in dealing with the uh, licensing, etc. And uh, yes, uh, just like Ruud explained, um, it was in 2018, in October, uh, at this television archiving conference, I've heard about this um, uh, opening up of the wartime collection in the Netherlands, uh, like totally in public online. I was really, really uh, more than surprised. I was like, um, whoa, such a thing is actually possible because uh, totally, actually, uh, the situation in Japan is um, almost uh, the opposite. We um, we want to cover it, uh, even if it's uh, the copyright is expired. Like we kind of try not to look at it directly. Um, we never think of putting them in public because uh, we, as a public broadcaster, we also have a huge collection from the wartime in our archive, and we all aware that uh, copyright is already gone and everything. But still, um, we just don't think about putting them in public because we just see it as a risk to do such a thing. Uh, well, nowadays there's a social media, like what if the right wing react in a very, very negative way? So we just see it as, um, so to say, a prob problematic thing to do. So yeah, when I heard about this Sound and Vision project, I was like, whoa. And then on top of that, uh, Ruhr told me that uh, they have this collection which was made by our country. So I got even more interested and therefore, I am here. Uh, I'm still working for a um, Japanese company, so uh, I would like to bring uh, what I have researched back home. And uh, before uh, moving on to the next slide, um, well, um, I, I just want to share a little bit about the uh, situation of these um, Creative Commons in Japan. 
Uh, because just like what I explained about the uh, footage from the wartime, how much, uh, how, how much, how less it is put in public in Japan. Uh, to be honest, the concept of Creative Commons or like uh, putting things in public domain is really not uh, well known in Japan. Um, a, uh, well, so I have many colleagues from who are in dealing with the production of documentaries or television programs, and uh, these people are really not aware like how much uh, footage, how much photos are actually out there for us to use in our production. Uh, we, uh, in a way, the media professionals, even the media professionals, are not aware. So I, well, I really see very uh, little knowledge among people uh, in Japan. And uh, uh, this is also the big reason that I thought opening up, together, opening up this collection together with Sound and Vision online would be a very uh, important and also uh, interesting case for us to learn. Uh, so uh, let's begin the, so this is the background information, so let's begin the slide. And, uh, uh, yeah, so when I heard about this collection, uh, to be honest, I didn't know uh, that uh, in Indonesia there was a film production of our country. And uh, of course, uh, I didn't also know that uh, it is kept in the Netherlands. And uh, so I started to do the research in Japan, like how much is known about this collection uh, in my country. And then I actually found out but uh, it was uh, in 1980s that the Japanese academic researcher found out that this collection still exists and preserved in the archive in the Netherlands. So and in 1989, there were two uh, documentaries made by my company, actually. And well, they went to film in the Netherlands, they went to Indonesia, uh, interviewed the uh, former film crews or the survivors. So actually there were two documentaries which were broadcasted already in 1989, but these documentaries are not uh, available online at all. So even for me, it took some time to discover this in our archive. So I assumed that, okay, this information that this, about this collection, about uh, that it's preserved in the Netherlands is totally uh, um, forgotten in my country, so that motivated me to uh, do the research further. And yes, so uh, I would like to uh, explain a little bit what this collection is. Uh, this is absolutely, yeah, this is the Japanese propaganda collection uh, made uh, from 1942 till 1945 in Indonesia by Japanese. Uh, it was made by this uh, national film production company called Nippon Egasha. And uh, it's of course the national governmental uh, production and Japan has uh, sent uh, 20, approximately 20 very talented film um, people, film people from the industry to Java and then set up the production and then made the uh, propaganda films for Indonesian locals. And uh, uh, the uh, whole purpose of making propaganda, yes, of course, uh, it was for uh, Indonesian people to understand our culture, our way of life, our way of thinking, our way of policy. And uh, films were so often about, okay, how to learn Japanese, how to keep your house tidy, how to show your respect to the Japanese emperor or politicians, and also how to ab avoid malaria, which was the very big uh, disease back then. And um, uh, the film studio in Java was actually the second biggest after that, after the one in Tokyo. So what they filmed in Indonesia was often um, sent to Japan and Japan did the same to Indonesia. So they were exchanging the uh, film footage. So in both countries they could report about each other. And uh, the what so uh, well of course they didn't have television back then in Indonesia so what were they uh, what were they oh come yes thank you uh, how were they actually screened uh, they were setting up the outside screening uh, theater to show the films so that people from the village could come outside and enjoy the so to say entertainment 
and uh, they also produced uh, radio programs, but then for radio programs, they actually managed to uh, set up the uh, outside speaker, which you can see in the middle on the top level, which looks like a little wooden house, but they actually are the speakers which were set up in the village. And yes, uh, and Japan was highly aware of the power of the moving images. That's the reason that they chose this approach to um, to explain uh, our new uh, the uh, explain about the well, so to say, new um, new occupier in Indonesia. And uh, well, Japan had an exp uh, experience with this propaganda making uh, in occupied Korea and in China. So they could really send a very talented uh, filmmakers um, to yeah. Indonesia to pursue. And uh, it was very uh, important to have this propaganda film approach in Indonesia because uh, Japan uh, considered the uh, literacy rate and also the diverse culture in Indonesia. And uh, yeah, that, that's why in from the 42 to 45, they really kept on producing so many films to Indonesian people. And uh, so uh, I would like to point out uh, how rare this footage is, uh, not only to you, but to us. Because, uh, yes, just like I said, uh, we have produced many films in China and Korea and in other part of Asian uh, state, cities. But actually, uh, when the war was close to end, when we were aware of our defeat, we, uh, um, we just, I mean, Japan ordered people just to burn as much as possible, like documents, films, and everything. So uh, the films produced in in China or in Korea, uh, there are only very few left. So um, uh, for me, uh, I thought it was such a uh, almost like a miracle that this film is still there and preserved in a very good condition in the Netherlands. Uh, and we actually, well, uh, for me. Um, uh, what fascinates me was, uh, oh my gosh, how, how did, how, who did this? Like, who did this confiscating and shipping nitrate film to the Netherlands in 1940s, like uh, right after this war? But this whole process of um, shipping and confiscating is still unknown. And if there are anybody uh, who are knowledgeable on this, I really would like to hear. <laughs> so I would like to show you uh, the uh, example of Ada the propaganda. Yang seven hari membagi this is LCA how to, this is showing how to prevent malaria. And you really can see um, many techniques combined in this piece. Pabrik -pabrik. Dan juga Kantor Kantor, Kebun, Felkina adalah suatu obat yang mustajab untuk membasmi penyakit malaria. Ialah obat yang terpuji sebagai penolong jiwa kita. Dengan obat itu, kita dapat hidup dengan tenang di daerah panas. This way of um, hand drawing techniques by both hands were extremely unique, and together with that animation. They were putting these um, microscopic films and this combination of many different techniques and editing, I find it quite uh, special. This was the way to show uh, people how to prevent it, how mosquitoes can really bring the malaria disease. Yes, uh, and uh, as we proceed the research, I found a very uh, interesting connection between this collection and the uh, One Dutch Man. And um, so now Ruth will talk about this um, uh, Dutch guy who had a huge influence on this collection.
Yeah, that's when J.C. Moll comes in. Uh, Jan Cornelis Moll, he was the son of a fruit vendor from uh, Venhuizen uh, near Horn. And uh, at the age of 19, he took over his father's v uh, fruit vending company and later became uh, director of a vegetable and fruit auction. Uh, and in the meanwhile, he was busy taking photographs and experimenting with uh, f the making of uh, photos and uh, the whole process surrounding it. And <clears throat> then in, um, what was it, 1921, he took over, he uh, bought this magazine, he, he sold his company and he thought, I want to make photos and pictures and I want to dedicate my life to that. So he sold his company and um, he took over a photo magazine called Focus. And in this uh, there was um, a magazine for amateur photo photography and um, he experimented with this and in 1923 he published his first article in this magazine about film. This, uh, If you take photos and you put them together you get this, this film. And he was really early in doing uh, so. And in 1927, he formed Multifilm, this uh, own company. And later on, he formed Multifilm Batavia when he, uh, he went to the Dutch East Indies. We'll talk uh, more about that later. So uh, Multifilm was founded in uh, the beautiful city of Haarlem. And um, in 1934, he uh, ma uh, made this invention, it, it got known. And, and again, you see here a photo from Delver. I saw Delver a few times today. Uh, it's a really valuable source to get uh, nice pictures and, and knowledge from uh, the days before. So we found this article about uh, J.C. Moll and his invention. And the special thing about this invention of this new film sound was that he used new techniques, um, which is the optical registrations of sound on 60 millimeter films. And this was new for the time, and because of this invention, the filming process became much more efficient, and he got more assignments by um, making this, uh, this invention. Um, so here we see a picture of Moll. It's uh, one of the few pictures, we, images we, we have of him. It was uh, quite a search to, to find some um, some material of J.C. Moll himself. And here you see him uh, at a setup. He had his own uh, studio, his uh, own laboratory. And maybe because his, uh, maybe because, because his uh, former job as a fruit vendor and uh, working with fruits and let things grow, he got into this time-lapse filming, taking photos with certain intervals, and then he showed in 15 seconds how a plant grows. So that was really something in those days. No one had never seen that before, at least uh, that we know of in Holland, for sure. Uh, and he, all, uh, he also had this uh, microscope with uh, camera systems on it, and then he uh, did experiments with microcinematography. And um, the, the nice thing about J.C. Moll <clears throat> is that um, he not only was experimenting, but he was creative, he was technical, and he wanted to tell people about this process of filming. So he, he was really forward and outgoing to tell the world how he did it. And here you see a fragment of J.C. Moll, and you hear J.C. Moll actually the film is talking himself. The film is a long celluloid, where thousands of films are afgedrukt. By the gewone film opname worden 24 van die filmbeeldjes iedere seconde opgenomen en met het projectietoestel worden de films altijd met dezelfde snelheid afgedraaid namelijk ook 24 beeldjes per seconde en u ziet dan op het doek de bewegingen natuurgetrouw terug <coughs> natuurgetrouw ja yeah. um, this is an example of a microscopic filming he did and this is a film from uh, 1927 and it became sort of famous, not only because the educative uh, thing and the, the experimenting and the new, thing, new things that it, n no one has never seen this uh, before, um, but he got highly rewarded in the avant-garde scene as well uh, for this abstract, abstract filming. And here there's no sound.
So that was an example. And this is a quite funny one and uh, used sound on this film as well. This is a, a boy eating a, a banana in reverse. Huh? And uh, this is one more film about uh, microscopic filming. This is a fragment from uh, a television show from the Avro from the 60s, in which uh, Jason Moll was uh, remembered, and uh, they showed some materials. Uh, in this case, uh, image of a water flea. Door the microscope sluipen we naar binnen in wat voor ons een microwereld is, maar voor de Daphnia de waterflow een volledige wereld om in geboren te worden, te leven en te sterven. Yeah, and then uh, it was 1939 and Jason Moore was very busy working on his films and then he got this assignment. In the meanwhile, he was uh, experimenting with color films and he was quite good at it. At it. And he got this assignment by the Koninklijke Rotterdamse Lloyd, a shipping company, to film the life on boat when people travel by boat and it took some weeks and he got this assignment to make a color movie and at the same time he wanted to go to the to the tropics to make color films in uh, the formal Dutch East Indies uh, to capture all the colors and all the beauty there in color for the first time um, so and then he went there and then something else happened Yes, and uh, well, it was 1942 that Japan started to occupy Indonesia. So uh, Mol was one of these people who were sent to the camp, uh, just like the other Dutch people in Java. But uh, well, soon after, Japan discovered he is extremely talented, he's very skillful. Uh, he also has a beautiful studio in, in, in Java. So he was taken out of the camp uh, by Japanese and uh, forced to work uh, with a Japanese crew. On this public, uh, on the on this propaganda film collection, and yes, uh, Japan confiscated uh, the mold studio as well, which was highly highly equipped with uh, most advanced uh, cameras. And I found uh, one testimony of the Japanese film um, crew who was there. Uh, they were. He was saying that he was ashamed to show what he brought from Japan uh, because it was totally outdated, just very old compared to what Moll had. And what Moll said to him was that Moll cannot work with the equipment that Japanese people had, uh, especially the sound recording system Moll had was uh, so good. So I, 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 I found that shows how much uh, Moll, this guy, was talented and uh, skilled. And the uh, next one is an uh, example uh, to show um, what kind of uh, propaganda was uh, made during the Java time, uh, during the occupation. Uh, this is to show, uh, to teach kids uh, the Japanese alphabet. Aiueo is our alphabet. So this, with this music and also the use of this moving animation, um, I, I guess, I, I assume that this was uh, very creative back then, um, uh, which was produced in Java. And uh, next, I, have, I also have one other movie, uh, which is the, this is the um, video to show the whole process of uh, sake making in Java. And I also found the similarity or the influence from Mole on this because Mole uh, also uh, filmed the uh, chocolate factory in, fa in Harlem with the same uh, kind of approach, like long shot, simply explain the uh, procedure of uh, production one after another. So from uh, this is one of the very few examples, one of the many examples, but uh, I could really find that uh, Mo was influencing and giving the techniques to Japanese people. And uh, yes, so uh, this production continued um, till we lost the war, it was in 1945. And uh, Mo was working till the very end of the occupational period. 
Uh, and after the war, well, uh, we read that uh, he was, uh, he went to Australia to recover from his health issue and he finally came back to the Netherlands in 1949 and worked for his studio in Harlem till 1954. And uh, this is an example of the uh, film which was made in Japan uh, after the war by the guy who worked with Mole. Uh, his name is uh, Kobayashi Yonesaku, and this was the uh, scientific film which was made in 1958. The title is uh, Living Bread. This shows the whole procedure of bread making, like how yeast grew to become a piece of bread. And back then, this film was appreci highly appreciated not only in Japan, but in the uh, international film industry. And uh, here you, I could also see that the uh, microscopic filming technique learned from Mol. Um, yeah, uh, we're almost at the end now of our uh, presentation. So the conclusion is uh, we will mark this uh, Japanese program the films as public domain. We did not do it yet, but we will as soon as possible. Uh, however, the material made by J.C. Moll is not yet in the public domain because he died in 1945. So that will be public domain in 2025. So we can have another party and celebrate J.C. Moll's life in five years. But now the Japanese propaganda films are made by an organization so we can mark them as public domain. And we will publish them online, we'll put it on our own website, put it on open images, transport it to Wikimedia, and we'll have a release po a symposium uh, later this year. Um, so we want to tell stories about this collection and release this material and inspire others to do so as well and to share their collections. And uh, Natsuko is working on uh, trying to find new ways of presenting the material. It can be AR, augmented reality, or virtual reality. Uh, Japan does a lot in 8K, so that can lead to something. And her plan is to make a documentary with the material in a co-production between NHK and others. So we're still working on this uh, project uh, to be continued. Uh, yes, uh, uh, this is this was one of the uh, example story we found about the uh, Dutch people uh, who were involved in this propaganda collection, and uh, I am st uh, I will keep on uh, searching for the stories uh, which uh, I could come up with the uh, documentary production. But uh, just uh, I would like to uh, point out one thing. Uh, I, uh, I said in the beginning that uh, this putting these historically sensitive material online in Japan it has been highly, highly difficult. But this time I'm um, truly grateful that um, we could try this out with this case together with the Sound and Vision who is um, who has experience with this. And I'm really um, looking forward how uh, what kind of um, uh, reactions I will get. Uh, because by providing these uh, materials available, uh, I, I, I guess uh, Japanese people can also find uh, relations to these or find some stories, simply discover, explore around this collection. So I hope by this way, I hope, uh, I hope to make this part of history uh, eternal and available. So thank you very much. Thank you.